collaborative work with my colleague Enrique Antonio at the Colmar Mouse Interior in Paris. Um, here's my submitted title, Functioning Environment Selecting for Epigenetic Memory, but a better subtitle is Only Gamble on Your Kid's Future if the Stakes Are Really High. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, some things that you're pretty familiar with, which are just some um, ideas about how inheritance can work in terms of um, having transgenerational effects. And so I'm starting with the normal setup where inheritance is just genotypic. So there are two genotypes on the slide, a red genotype, which always produces red offspring, clonal inheritance, a blue genotype that always produces blue offspring. Importantly, offspring develop independently of uh, both the environment and um, it's conditionally independent of the maternal phenotype, but only depends on their genotype. Um, so here's another possibility. So this idea of randomizing offspring, um, also often known as diversifying bet hedging. Um, and the idea here is that this is a slide with a single genotype on here. The genotype has a strategy, which is that regardless of the parental phenotype, they produce two-thirds red and one-third blue offspring. Um, so in the next generation, the blue ones will go on and produce two-thirds blue offspring. This could actually happen either because parents do something to provide a cue or resources offspring, or it could happen because of some developmental trajectory that's sort of um, inherently stochastic. Um, again, though, it's independent of environment, and then you put environment on the figure. Um, and so, sort of really classic results, classical results in this area is this idea that in fluctuating environments, the geometric mean of fitness averaged over time um, is going to be a measure of uh, selection, it's going to be a measure of clone growth rate, really. And um, what I've put on this figure is a comparison between two different types, two different phenotypes, type A and type B. One of them does good in odd years, one of them does good in even years, and it's just set up so that one of them it doubles or goes down by half every other generation. And so there's this blue and uh, green curvy thing. Over the long run, their geometric mean fitness is one, so they're not going up or going down. But a strategy, this is a genotype that produces a mixture of offspring, produces half the blue and half the green offspring, um, has an average fitness each generation of 1.25. So that's this curve here, there's geometric growth. So this is this really classical result that bet hedging, diversifying offspring, can be favored in random environments. Um, what I'm going to contrast this with are some other types of strategies, including this idea of a deterministic maternal effect. So here, this whole slide is one genotype. Um, in environment A, regardless of the parental phenotype, red or blue, they produce red offspring. In environment B, regardless of the parental phenotype, red or blue, they produce blue offspring. So this is sometimes called a transgenerational, transgenerational plasticity. Um, we call it a deterministic maternal effect. And um, the idea is that offspring phenotype depends only on the maternal environment. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you some results that um, are in paper that we just had published in AMNAP. And what this uh, figure does is it looks at the geometric mean fitness of these different strategies depending on the fitness effects of the phenotypes, which you can't see on the graph, and the uh, rates of change in the environment. So this is the probability of going from environment one to environment two, the probability of going from environment two to environment one. So up here, the environment alternates every generation, every other generation, environment A, environment B. Down here, the environment stays the same for like a billion years and then changes and stays the same for like a billion years. On this negative diagonal, there's no information about the future generation, um, whereas up here, there's lots of information, down there, there's lots of information. What this uh, colors show are which strategies are favored. So if there's no color, if it's white, a purely genetic inheritance strategy is favored. Um, up here, this deterministic maternal effect where mom predicts the offspring will have the opposite environment is favored. Down here in this reddish color, uh, moms predict that their offspring will be in the same environment, so that kind of maternal effect is favored. And the blue region is where this randomizing maternal effect or bet hedging strategy is favored. Um, so what do you get from this figure? If there's lots of information in the environment, use the information. It's pretty obvious. If there's not much information, then these bet hedging strategies um, can be favored. It also turns out that the amount of area in this blue space depends on uh, 
the absolute magnitude of the fitness effect. So when the stakes are really high, when a mismatched offspring basically always dies, this blue region will get bigger, and that means the region that favors bet hedging will get bigger. Um, so we also uh, did some work to look at how if the, the phenotypes and the maternal effect strategy can both evolve, um, what kind of maternal effects will invade? So the idea is you think about a population where there are no maternal effects, there's a single Z trait value that's produced, and that's going to evolve to some attractor, and then it turns out at that attractor, the deterministic maternal effect is always favored. So this little movie to kind of show what would happen, and if anybody wants to know more, I'll explain afterwards. Um, but the idea is that the population, the population, the parameters are sort of where the black dot is, and uh, um, it's a great movie. And uh, what happens is these blue things spread out, um, but initially, when it's near this attractor where there's no maternal effect, the deterministic maternal effects are always going to have higher um, selection coefficient than the bet hedging randomizing offspring kind of strategy will. Um, so I'm going to condense into like 20 seconds an embarrassingly large amount of work um, that was done mostly by Henri's postdoc, Snake Day, um, where what they did was they uh, did experimental evolution with nematodes in fluctuating or random environments. Um, and the environment in question was whether or not there was oxygen available at a period of um, offspring development, so an early, sort of when there were still embryos and eggs, they suck all the oxygen out of this box every other generation, um, and it provides strong selection. Um, and what we found was after experimental evolution, the moms evolved to provision these offspring, so it actually turns out they provide extra glycogen, um, but only when moms are in the, in the normal oxygen environment. So they had a, a cue, which was they didn't experience anoxia when they were young, five days later, they provision their offspring um, in preparation for them encountering the bad environment in the next generation. Um, okay, so we've been talking about these different kinds of maternal effects um, and these randomizing effects. What I want to do now is sort of ask um, how we can use the same kind of approach to understand the evolution of epigenetic memory. Um, and it turns out that we can use a similar kind of, of approach to write down the growth rate of the genotypic clone um, over time uh, where we have some kind of inheritance matrix there. So this is actually pure genetic inheritance where if mom is phenotype one, or if mom is genotype one, her offspring inherit genotype one, if mom is genotype two, her offspring inherit genotype two. And we have some fitness matrix and we put those together in some sequence, and if, it's, if these matrices are the same, this is just an eigenvalue problem. Um, but it turns out if they're not the same, things can get really complicated. So here we have um, this representation of three different types of maternal effect strategies. Um, this deterministic maternal effect, this randomizing maternal effect, and epigenetic memory kind of process. And I showed you before um, something about pictures describing these maternal, deterministic maternal effects and this randomizing effect. Um, and what you notice in these matrices, so these are basically the sort of inheritance matrix. matrix. Here, the matrix is environment dependent. That's environment one and environment two. For bed hedging or randomizing um, maternal effects, it's independent of the environment. But in both cases, the rows are multiples of each other, which means it just becomes a geometric mean problem and it's simple. Um, in the case of epigenetic memory, what this matrix says is that the probability that an offspring inherits mom's phenotype depends on which phenotypic state she's in, and there's some probability of going from phenotype 1 to phenotype 2 every generation. Um, so this is actually, if you want to calculate the growth rate, this problem is called um, a random product of matrices. It's not a product of random matrices, it's a random product of matrices. It's a really hard problem in the math world. This is the Lyapunov exponent stuff, and they're notoriously difficult. I don't have any tools to do it. We're going to do some numerical stuff. Um, <laughs> skip to that. So um, what this figure shows is actually a comparison now between this deterministic maternal effect and 
a carryover um, where uh, actually where an epigenetic memory kind of uh, model where offspring tend to have the opposite phenotype as their mother um, because in this case the environment is just completely alter alternates every generation um, and so here if so beta is the probability that the offspring gets the other phenotype if that were one it would be exactly the same as the determinist of external effect and there one would be better than the other there's a little bit of a robustness issue but otherwise they'd be the same um, and so comparing it to a situation where this is perfect deterministic maternal effect, and the blue area, which is the whole graph, is where the perfect deterministic effect is favored. Okay, not too surprising, because it's sort of perfect, and this other thing isn't. Um, but so we can say, okay, well, what if we put in um, some imperfection in this deterministic maternal effect? Basically, 10% of mothers misread the environment and do the wrong thing. Um, still, the entire figure is blue. It's not all blue. It's kind of blue. Boring, but I guess it's true a result. Um, that's not what's going to happen. So if we crank it up. Um, what happens is now we have a region where carryover is favored and a region where um, this deterministic maternal effect is favored. If we crank it up even more, that region gets smaller. But what you notice is that um, even when we crank it up, there's a region around the diagonal where the deterministic maternal effect is favored. What does that mean? Well, that's the ancestral state. That's where this sort of ancestral attractor is. If there isn't yet a maternal effect, a small difference between the two z values is going to favor this deterministic maternal effect, just like we saw for the comparison between um, bet hedging and this deterministic maternal effect. So again, the punchline is, punch is only when things are really bad, when the z values are pretty different, when the stakes are really high, when a large fraction of offspring are going to die if they're in the wrong environment, is um, carryover going to be favored? So um, what we're trying to do now is come up with some techniques to um, analyze some approximations about this. And what we really want to know is um, not can epigenetic memory be beneficial? That's already been shown. But it's probably the wrong question. And now I've got Seaball, which is not the same as Cofee. <laughs> 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 so, can epigenetic memory outcompete these other two strategies. And I'm not convinced that it can because there's not a lot of space for it to succeed. If we're down here and here, there's no information. Randomizing effects are always going to be better. If you're way out there, there's lots of information. Deterministic maternal effects are going to be better. So maybe somewhere in the middle, there's a range where um, these uh, epigenetic carryover effects can outcompete um, both of these other two. Um, and so, there's some acknowledgments, and we probably have like 12 seconds for questions. Yes? Do you think that if the environment varies uh, like quantitatively, rather than between two qualitative states, there might be more room for carryover? Yeah, except so, what I should have said earlier is Jim Bull analyzed this uh, basically at selection for variance in 1987. And, um, and so as a general result, the strength of selection has to be strong to favor um, the diversifying uh, offspring. But in both cases, the selection coefficient for diversifying is um, the first order selection coefficient is zero. So it's very weak selection, um, even if the environment are very continuous.